So Revelation 17, let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. Revelation 17. And we'll start at verse 1. Revelation 17 and verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit and through the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that, it, that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast." Uh, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are people, peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Uh, tonight's uh, message is part two of the judgment of Babylon. The judgment of Babylon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And uh, This is uh, uh, chapter 17 and 18, just packed full of, of uh, just imagery here and, and uh, so much significance uh, regarding the the world and Antichrist, and uh, pray that you would help me to be accurate in preaching it. Uh, may you uh, help me to uh, help us apply it and, uh, and, and bring out the application to it for our lives, but also have an understanding of what these things mean. And Lord, I pray that you would accomplish uh, your purposes in our hearts and be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, last week we focused on historical Babylon, such as the Babylonian Empire and uh, the Tower of Babel. Uh, and the main characteristic of Babylon, which is, is whoredom, uh, the great whore, uh, selling oneself out with fornication also comes with that, an attitude of rebellion. Um, it's, uh, those, those things go together. Now, various ideas have been given regarding the identity of Babylon. Oh, this is Babylon, that's Babylon, and what's Babylon? And uh, so, uh, question is, is it Rome? Is it the USA? Uh, is it a city that is yet to be built? Is it is something different, something even bigger? You know, different, there's been different speculation. And I have always, I've always viewed Babylon as a, uh, a world system, as a system, the beast system. And uh, at the same time, some of the language used in Revel uh, Revelation 17, also chapter 18 especially, seem to indicate a literal city being burned with fire. And so I don't want to overlook that, that there is some element of a city being destroyed. Uh, what we also see, though, is uh, there's, it's a mixture of a literal, there's, there's an aspect of a literal city, but there's then also the focus on the ideology, the description of what Babylon is like. And I think it goes, goes beyond a city because if there is a city that is referenced here, that whether it's a current city, whether it's 
a city that is yet to be built that would literally be called Babylon or whether it be a different name, but it's, it's called Babylon in the Bible because of what it represents and its characteristics. Um, it still has to do with the whole world system because you could, have, you could have a seat of power, a seat of influence that then spreads throughout the world and affects the whole world system. So I think there's elements of both in there. Uh, but I do believe it's bigger than, than just simply a city. Uh, the character of the city is the character of the world system. And these, uh, I, and I will, I will say, I like these chapters. These are very compelling chapters. They're very interesting when you look at the subject matter. But I will say, I found it more difficult. I found it difficult to organize into messages. Okay, how do you? There's, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of facts here. But, but how does this get organized into, into messages? Because while Babylon. The Babylon system of the beast is, is very obvious to me. I, I look at the world, I look at the things and match it up, you line it up with scripture, and, and you can see, okay, yeah, this has to do with the char same characteristics we see here of Babylon, mystery Babylon. It is a mystery, and uh, this, it's, that's now being revealed in a greater way here, but there are so many, so many facets to Babylon, so many facets to mystery Babylon that it's hard just to pin down and say, well, it's just this one thing, or it's just this. When, the, when you look at the whole spokes, the, the spokes of the whole wheel of the world system, it, it gets very complex. But yet, it, it mysteriously, it very strangely interconnects, intertwines, and, and goes together in unison. Now, we're going to look at uh, different aspects here addressed in uh, uh, different ca uh, characters here addressed in Revelation 17. And the first is the woman. Uh, in verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so... This is the, the heart of the abominations of the earth, the root of the abominations of the earth, mother of harlots. And so there are, uh, if you want to say offspring, harlot offspring, <laughs> that uh, are involved here. And the, along with, with being a harlot, well, what does the Bible speak about? It speaks about the attire of a harlot. And so there's certainly a seductive sense here, a seductive uh, element that is going on that the kings of the earth would commit fornication. And a woman rides on the beast. A woman riding the beast. What's the significance of riding on the beast? Well, this seductive woman, this harlot woman, this whorish woman, uh, rides on the beast to be on full display and seduce the kings of the earth into committing fornication with her. Now, I, I was thinking about this, that the, there's the combination. So, Revelation 17 seems to indicate more of the religious aspect of Babylon, where uh, 18 is more of the economic aspect of Babylon. But intertwined with both of them have to do with politics. Politics. And I was thinking about this, that um, when, well, why would it be... Yeah, have, you ever, have you ever wondered why politicians and other government leaders uh, do what they do? You know, it just seems like they're so disconnected that once they get to the highest levels, there's just something about them that is just very disconnected from just your average person. And they are people. I mean, they're just people. But yet there's something about them at the highest levels. Uh, I believe that's because there is some next level influence and power that they're connected to. There's a machine, there's a machinery that is in place. You know, some, some called it, uh, um, you know, some like to call it the deep state. Some call it the swamp. Some call it, you know, whatever, the bureaucracy. Or, uh, but there's, there's something there. There's a mechanism. There's a system that's put into place that you might vote for different people. Some people get voted in. Others get voted out. 
but yet why does it seem like things keep on the same trajectory? It's because there's a different structure that's in place that goes beyond just who you're electing to office. And why does it seem like, you know, there's times I've seen candidates, they say the right thing when they're trying to get elected and they have a track record. Wow, these are really some solid people. And then all of a sudden they uh, get to the highest levels. They get to Washington and they, they seem to change. And all of a sudden they fall into lockstep with um, what the agenda is. There was a, a pastor, I don't know if he started a church in Maryland, or he, uh, but it was in the D.C. area. And uh, he, told, he, he mentioned one time, I don't know if he said this to me, but um, he said, he, and he was in, uh, either in the military or, or connected with um, the Defense Department somehow. I don't know if he was directly in the military, but he, was, he had a background in the Department of Defense. And he had said he had... Uh, gotten to be near Donald Rumsfeld, who was the Secretary of Defense at one point under George W. Bush. And uh, he, uh, he said, and he didn't elaborate on this, but I just remember him saying, whether it was to me or the other person he was talking to, he said, you know, I was next to Donald Rumsfeld, and he said, I could just sense the spirit of Antichrist coming off of him. I don't know this pastor well. I don't know really anything else about him. This was a number of year, quite a few years ago. But I found it very, it just caught my attention, very interesting that he would say that. He just could sense the spirit of Antichrist coming off of him. And uh, then we have the seven mountains in verse 9. Uh, and there, those are often viewed as proof that Rome is spoken of here, and it may be. There, there's actually a lot that ties in with Rome uh, and the Roman Catholic Church. You see the, the color scarlet. You see all these being decked out in all this fancy clothing. And so there's much here that, uh, that ties in with Rome. And as a matter of fact, many of the old-time commentators, particularly Protestant commentators, uh, the Reformers, they often uh, would attribute or call the Pope the Antichrist, and they would call Rome uh, they, they would attribute that to the Antichrist system. Uh, I don't go that far as to say the Pope would be the Antichrist. The Pope may be the false prophet. Uh, but at the same time, there was a recognition, there was a widespread recognition that the characteristics of the Roman system matched what was seen here in Revelation chapter 17. And so I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, objecting to that. But I think it's a bigger, it's a bigger thing. I think it's the, there, there's the certainly, it seems to be a literal city. Now, is it New York City? I don't think it's New York City. It could be. I think it's whatever it would be would be probably centered over in Europe or the Middle East somewhere if there is a new city that's built. And let me tell you, over there in the Middle East, they know how to build some cities and they can do them pretty quick. There are some incredible cities that, I mean, no American city even compares to some of the cities that have been built, the futuristic modern cities that have been built in other parts of the world. I mean, you know, we think, oh, America, look at our cities. Well, no, I mean, we've been left in the dust in many ways when it comes to uh, uh, what other countries are doing. And um, as far as the cities are concerned, the modern, modern cities. Um, as a matter of fact, when you hear what's been happening in a lot of our cities in America, it's been the exact opposite. There's been the degradation of the cities, but uh, not in other parts of the world. And right now, I do believe we are in a, a time where there's a greater balance of power that is, uh, that is shifting. And uh, more and more is going to happen where the influential countries are going to be over in Europe or going to be in the Middle East or Asia, where there's a balance of power shifting as America uh, continues a uh, decline. Now, things can all obviously change. I mean, I'm not pr uh, predicting the future as far as specific events here, but I do see that there's the balance of power that's shifting as, uh, in, in, uh, regarding what's happening in America at this point. Uh, Brian Sharp, actually, uh, and I've, I've been referring to a couple different commentaries uh, during the pre preparation for this message, and so uh, sometimes I'll bring out certain ideas that uh, one of them has, and uh, I've been reading Brian Sharp's commentary on Revelation and then David Cloud's commentary on Revelation, and in a lot of ways they're very similar, but yet they're written differently, 
and so they actually complement each other very well. Uh, but sometimes there are certain things where they have uh, different ideas on what some things mean, and particularly Brian Sharp has a different idea about the seven mountains that uh, includes control of all aspect of the world system. So he, he views, because uh, you notice uh, later on in the chapter, uh, it says the seven, verse nine, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So the woman's sitting on seven mountains. Um, but he, he, he actually attributes, he believes that the, uh, the seven mountains are the, all aspects, the complete aspect of the world system, and he specifically lists finance, education, humanism, military, religious, political, and oratorical. So that's, that's what he attributes that to. He also, he, I mean, I think he views Rome as, as having a part in it as well, but David Cloud in his commentary focuses a lot more on Rome and some of the history of Rome. And if you look at the, um, the description here, in verse 4, the golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, Rome has a long history of the popes and the priests and all of these things. I mean, even going back centuries and centuries, there was, there was literal harlotry going on in Rome, yeah. in the Vatican. Uh, there were popes that were committing fornication. Uh, there are priests. I mean, fornication is rampant among the priests, uh, and as well as, of course, we know from a number of years ago, the uh, abuse scandal that came out about the, that was just widespread systemic. It's not like a church here and there, like you hear, and that can happen in any kind of church. It's not just exclusive to them, but nothing was so systemic as it was with the Roman Catholic Church of how much was happening. And so, once again, very perfectly fits in here uh, as part of that system. The other aspect of it is um, that the, there's, there is a Rome connection with political leaders, with education, with religion. Uh, there's, there's the current building of a one world religion under Rome where a lot of, of these offspring of Rome are coming back under Rome's uh, influence and the, the unit, unification of these religions. And the fact is that now, there's some things that they've been, uh, these ecumenical gatherings that even included paganism. And so it goes beyond. It goes to other, even other religions, but they're coming together. As a matter of fact, there's a new, um, a new uh, thing over in, I think it's in the United Arab Emirates, uh, that's the Abrahamic, um, uh, like a, a museum or some sort of big thing where there's different, uh, either three different buildings or some connection of the Abrahamic religions, and that's meant to foster peace and understanding among the religions of the world, and the three primarily religions of the world, which would be Islam, uh, Christianity, which certainly includes Catholicism, they would include Catholicism, and then Judaism. And so that's over in, in a, once again, a Middle Eastern country, and, uh, and has, I think, just been opened or dedicated, and uh, that certainly is part of building that one world uh, religion. So really all that's needed is a consolidation of power and cooperation. It doesn't even require everybody formally coming under the headship of one organization. If everybody's moving in lockstep, that is enough to bring everybody together into one world religion. But ultimately, and it could be that it does organize into a more formal one world religion, although there's, there's a lot of splintering today. But if you look at the World Council of Churches and how many denominations are part of that and the National Council of Churches, they're all moving in lockstep, in lockstep. And what are their values? Their values are the social gospel progressive values that even many non-church related people would go along with. So that fits right into this development of the, uh, the, this, the system, the beast system, the Antichrist. The uh, meaning of the waters, look down at verse 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now this, the waters seem to indicate, the meaning of the waters seem to indicate that this is a worldwide influence which does also fit with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had a worldwide influence and, and, it, it's, uh, and then its offspring down through the years, even after the Roman Empire officially came to an end, 
uh, in, in is what we would consider the decline in history. There's been the offspring and the rem, uh, lingering effects of that. There's actually a statue outside the Council of Europe building in Brussels, and Brussels is the heart of the, the European Union, uh, that is the goddess Europa riding on the back of a bull that is supposed to be Zeus. And, uh, and I'm not saying that this bull is exactly this beast in Revelation 17, but it's interesting how you see some similar imagery of what's going on in the world to what the Bible speaks of. I don't think it's completely disconnected. But Zeus, apparently the, the myth, myth goes that he changed himself into a bull because he was so infatuated or captivated by her. He chained himself, changed himself into a bull, then she came up and uh, 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 he, 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 blend, he went along with the other cattle or the, the other cows and she was there and, and started uh, you know, petting him or rubbing him or something. Then she gets up on him, starts riding him and he takes off and takes her away and has relations with her and then there's an offspring and I mean all that whole thing. But, um, and, uh, and this is a very, very uh, basic uh, uh, statue. It's not... Um, uh, but you can get the idea of what, uh, what it is. There are other illustrations of Europa uh, riding on, uh, on top of this bull that I would not recommend you look at. <laughs> uh, but basically, once again, very much fits with a harlot woman, a whorish woman, and fornication, woman riding the beast. And that is outside of the uh, European Union, the Council of, of Europe building in Brussels. She is also, she's drunken with the blood of saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Uh, and it says uh, in verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now when he's admiring her, he's not like, ooh, this is so wonderful. He's, he's staring in wonder and awe. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a positive thing. It was just simply an amazing sight to behold, and he was just mystified by it. And uh, drunken or intoxication has two meanings. Now, you think, how, how would what we think, when we think of drunken, we think of somebody who's in a stupor, somebody who is, they don't even have all their faculties there, and, and that's primarily the way we use the word drunken or, or intoxication. So the first definition is the condition of having physical or mental control markedly diminished by the effects of alcohol or drugs. But the second definition of drunken, or I should say intoxication, is a strong excitement or elation. A strong excitement or elation. And that's what I picture here. I believe that is the word, the definition here, that drunken with the blood. And yes, there could, there, along with that excitement and elation, there's also a not being in the right frame of mind. But there's this, just, I mean, pic, picture, if you can, this, this woman and picture being drunken instead of drinking an alcoholic beverage drinking the blood of saints and martyrs, that's the picture that's painted here, and just uh, having just such an elation and excitement, a delight and a glee that it just puts her in, her, like in a different state of mind because of the excitement over that, of how many martyrs there have been, how much, how much uh, a death there has been of those who are the saints. That is the Babylon mentality, the Babylon mentality. The, uh, and going back to the Roman church, the Roman church is responsible for most of the blood shed by the saints of God throughout history, primarily. There have been, many, uh, there have been others. Uh, there are other religions catching up, such as Islam. They've shed a lot of blood. And, uh, and then there are extreme versions of other religions, such as Hindu nationalism, and they are persecuting people in different places, like in India, although there's maybe not quite as much blood shed there. So this really ties into going beyond Rome, but the entire world system is one of blasphemy and rebellion against God. And so, you know, Jesus said, marvel not if the world hate you. You know, don't be surprised at that because the world, what, what world? The world system. The world system, those who don't know Christ. Don't be surprised at that. 
because the world system is one of blasphemy and rebellion. The inhabitants of the earth, not only was she drunk with the blood of martyrs, the blood of the saints, the inhabitants of the earth are made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In, uh, in verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. What is fornication? It's an unholy alliance, and an unholy, unequal yoking. An improper, impure yoking together. And that's, that's, we see that happening all around us. Impure mixing. Uh, between politics and, and pop culture and the spirit of this world and, and religion, and religion yoking up and being in, entwined with that. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So what does it say, inhabitants of the earth? So it's a worldwide phenomenon. So they, and you know, there are, there are countless ways in which the world system seduces its inhabitants countless ways. I mean, now, I mean, there is something for everybody, and it will catch you up in that system. Now, my dad, uh, when he taught a Sunday school class in the church I grew up in many years ago, uh, and I was in that class at the time, I don't know how old I was, uh, he just put it very simply. Uh, He just says, the world has a system, and the system stinks. (laughs) <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> Just very plain about that. You know, the world has a system and the system stinks. And, uh, but it is. That's what it is. It is the world system. And uh, the world system is built. The, the, the mechanism of the world system is not friendly to Bible-believing Christianity and to Jesus Christ. And so there are those who... Um, there are those uh, that are trying to redeem Hollywood. Let's get more Christian entertainment into Hollywood. Let's get Hollywood to make more Christian films. Why, why are we yoking up with Hollywood and the lost, lost, by the way, lost actors who play in Christian movies? Many of them are. Not, most of them are not Christians who play in Christian movies. And uh, by the way, one of the actor actresses who... Um, is is uh, she played uh, not a reg? I don't know if she's a regular, but she played uh, I think maybe Thomas's sister or something in The Chosen. She's in an, another show, a secular show, uh, that where she's in a relationship with another woman. Now, to me, that's an unequal, uh, uh, an impure mixture there. And so people were watching this show. Oh, look at these actors! Look at they do such a wonderful thing. Most of them are not Christians either. And um, so there is no redeeming Hollywood. And uh, this isn't really for tonight, but what, did, uh, what was said in chapter 18 and verse 4, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. And I realize that is um, specifically talking about the city at that point in time, but there's the application when it comes to the Babylon system that there's, there's the application of coming out of her and saying, look, we're not going to be uh, partakers of, this, uh, of, of the things that are against God and uh, the things that are uh, related to fornication. And I realize we live in this, uh, we live in this world. You know, Daniel had to live in Babylon. Daniel had to live in Babylon. What did he do? He maintained his integrity. He maintained uh, steadfast commitment to the Lord. And I probably should just save that for next week, so we'll uh, stop there. But uh, 1 John, what is, what is the world system? The world system really is described in a nutshell in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love the world and love the Father properly at the same time. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now let's turn our attention to the beast here uh, in verse 8. Verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now the beast is the Antichrist. And there are a couple of interesting phrases in verse 8 um, that, um, 
maybe a bit unclear in their meaning. And I've, this is one of those areas where the two commentators I was looking at uh, kind of diverged a little bit. And, uh, and I had heard Brian Sharp teach this before. I've, I've listened to his Revelation series. Brian Sharp actually believes, he seems to indicate that he believes, and in his commentary he suggested this as well. When it says, the, uh, is, uh, that was and is not and yet is, he takes that as somebody who previously lived, was not alive during the time of John, but yet will be alive at the time of the Antichrist. And he, he seems to match that up with Judas. That's his, his theory. Um, but uh, I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm just putting that out there. The other good possibility, there was also the reference to the beast uh, getting a deadly wound and being healed. And so that simply could be a reference to uh, he lived, he appeared to die or did die, and then, and then he was healed of that deadly wound. Um, so I'm not going to be dogmatic. And I'm telling you, I, when it comes to Revelation, I'm always just going line upon line, layer upon layer of learning, and I'm not saying I have all of Revelation figured out. So that's why, especially in these chapters, I try to be careful uh, in what I'm dogmatic about in, in preaching. But I wanted to put some of those out there that are uh, certainly not um, uh, certainly plausible ideas. Uh, the the uh, one thing that is in Scripture that you can see this is that the Antichrist is described as the son of perdition and Judas was described as the son of perdition. So at the very least, there's always been an Antichrist. There have been many Antichrists in the world and Judas is certainly one of them. Uh, and there, the devil has had many Antichrists, but they're both uh, described as the son of perdition, John 17, 12, and then the Antichrist being described that way in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Now one of the things about the beast and the harlot is that they use each other for a while. They use each other for the, really their own benefit for a while. So you have the woman riding the beast. And so it's the beast that's carrying the woman, this mystery Babylon. And so here she is uh, on a pedestal. Here she is lifted up and there for all to see and all to to, to you know, the, the kings of the earth to commit fornication and then the, the inhabitants of the earth to be, in, uh, be drunken by the wine of her fornication. And so they use each other for a while. So the woman gets to use the beast to lift herself up, but then the beast gets to use the woman to propel his system forward to, to, for his own gain. And that's just as any wicked man who goes after harlots... He uses them and then despises them. There's no true love there. There's no true love there in harlotry and fornication. And what we're going to see here, lastly, with the ten kings, uh, the, the last of the three here with the ten kings, uh, is that uh, they're going to hate the woman. They're going to hate the woman. Uh, they are going to uh, hate the whore, as the Bible says in verse 16. Now, uh, look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power uh, and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is lord of lords and king of kings. Now let me back up. I might have uh, uh, started too late there. Let me uh, read verse 10. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Uh, and uh, there's, there's different ideas about what that may refer to. Some believe that is the, uh, those are referring to initially some emperors. Um, but then, uh, uh, you know, once again, this is where the commentators that I've read, uh, dive, they, they have different uh, viewpoints on that. Uh, Brian Sharp doesn't, he says, you got to really, you got to really massage the math. You really got to work out the math with those emperors to get that to fit here. Uh, so he actually believes that it uh, is a relation to directly with the uh, nation of Israel and uh, that there's, there's a significance in those numbers of countries that have gone against Israel. And that is, that is what uh, he lays out there. Uh, but then, you, so then you go to the ten horns, 
And those are 10 kings. Who are the 10 kings? You know, I don't want a message that raises more questions and questions than answers. So we're going we're gonna to finish the message on some two main points that are just laid out in black and white here. But first, with these 10 kings, uh, who are the 10 kings? Well, one, one belief is that they are 10 kings to the east of Israel that will march against her at Armageddon, which is a good possibility. This is right before Armageddon. Uh, the other part of it is Daniel talks about the ten horns, or ten horns or ten kings. I've also heard that there will be ten regional kings who rule the world, uh, so that, that then are united with, uh, with Antichrist. So uh, there's a lot of things when it comes to prophecy, those specific things, that they don't always, they're not always clear right away. Uh, there's, but there's some good ideas to be had uh, from different uh, directions. Uh, no matter who they are, uh, they're going to be in submission to the beast and they're going to hate the whore. They're going to give their power as kings one hour with the beast. Interesting, it says they have received no kingdom as yet. So evidently these are just, they're figureheads and they're, they're, they're just kind of lackeys for the beast, uh, for <laughs> lack of a better term. Uh, they have, and notice they have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And so they are there to lead their respective, whoever they have authority, or at least stated to have authority over, to lead people toward the beast and to strengthen him and empower him. They are, uh, let's, let's go down to verse um, 16, and ten horns with that which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And then in chapter 18 we get into more of the description of it being spoken as a city. So there's the ideology, the, the characteristics of this woman, but then there is the reference to a specific uh, city, uh, Babylon, in chapter 18. And it, it indicates more of an economic aspect to that. But they're going to they're gonna hate the whore. It says they'll make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And so they, what, what's the motivation for this? Well, for the Antichrist, it's that he doesn't need her anymore. Once he's accomplished his purpose of gaining power and gaining, and particularly if this pertains to the Roman Catholic Church, yes, the church will be used to unite the world under one religion and then usher in the Antichrist, but then once the Antichrist is in power, he's not going to share his glory with anybody. And so he will have no more need of the woman, that particular system, that particular uh, uh, influence. They will probably, the kings of the earth might, this is just my, my thinking was, that they might resent the enticement and influence of the woman, which is so often hating the very thing that entices you the most because it takes you out of control. That's what happens when people get into the bondage of sin. They end up hating the very thing they struggle with the most and because of the... Uh, the bondage. So they, they kind of act like they love it because they keep going back to it, but in reality they hate it because of the control that it exercises over them. You know, pornography can do that. Uh, all kinds of other, other things, other immorality and wickedness will do that. The, uh, you know, the Antichrist will not tolerate any other person or system sharing his power or glory because eventually it will be all about the worship of him. But here are my two main points to finish. Number one, they will not succeed. These kings will not succeed in their war against Jesus Christ. Notice uh, in verse uh, 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. And that seems to indicate, uh, since we're getting right up against Armageddon here, that uh, that may be a reference to that war against the Lamb, that that would be a reference to Armageddon, that they're going against the Lamb. They're going against the Lamb's people, the saints, the remnant that's there. But either way, they make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, we're not on the uh, chapter regarding Armageddon yet, but Brian Sharp likes to say this in his preaching. He's said this before in his prophecy, uh, prophetic preaching. Um, 
not, not he's not prophesying. He's preaching about prophecy. Is, you know what I mean? Uh, but he preaches a lot on revelation and prophecy in Israel and things. But uh, he says, you know, right now it's a jihad. But with all right, Armageddon, it's going to be a yeehaw. <laughs> Coming back on the horses. <laughs> he said, it's going to be a yeehaw. But notice, who are with him? They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So they will not succeed in their war against Jesus Christ. And just as that all reaches a climax and a culmination in Armageddon, because that's what everything's headed toward, even today, just, just uh, rest assured, be confident in the fact, no matter how powerful this evil, perverse world system gets, that turns everything on its head, that hates Christ, that hates his word, that hates uh, the, the principles of God's word, that hates morality, that that will not ultimately succeed. And then, second, God is still the one in charge. God is still the one in charge. Even what is spoken here about the, the woman, the, the harlot, the, the whore, and then the beast, and then these kings, and what they do, notice in verse um, 16, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. You know, we need, a, we need to fight the new world order. We need to fight the system of Antichrist. We need to keep that from happening. We need to, you're not going to keep it from happening because God's going to make sure it happens. That, that can turn people's worlds upside down. Wait a minute, we're not supposed to fight against the establishment of an Antichrist kingdom? No, that's not our job. God's going to wipe it out. He's going to destroy it when it's time. So no, we're not to be here to fight the New World Order. We're not here to uh, uh, try to prevent a one world system from being set up. We're here to do the will of the Lord for us, which is preaching the gospel and, and, helping and, and, and trying to bring as many people with us into the kingdom as we can, into the family of God. That is our mission. Because God is the one in charge. God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. What is he doing? He's making sure that all of his words will be fulfilled. And he's going to do that. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now I believe that if, um, if there's a, some great revival and a true awakening, not a false awakening, true revival that, that, that spreads across a nation or, or, uh, part, or multiple nations, you know, uh, things could happen and it could hinder the devil's timeline. So I'm not saying that we just sit back and say, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. I'm not saying that that is just inevitable in the season and the day and hour in which we live. But what I am saying is that ultimately it's going to happen because God said it is going to happen. And so we need to make sure we have our priorities straight of God, what God wants us to be about. And it's still about the Great Commission. It's still about preaching the gospel. Uh, you know, Lord willing, a couple weeks we'll be baptizing. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then teaching them to observe all things. And just as Daniel uh, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in Babylon... And they maintain their walk with God. They maintain their faithfulness to the Lord. That's what we need to be about in this increasingly Babylonian world in which we live, the system in which we live. We need to still be about that and incur it in ourselves, staying faithful, but then helping others, equipping and building others, other saints to stay faithful as well, but then also trying to bring others with us into the kingdom of God. And so if you got nothing else, hopefully those other things didn't raise too many questions, but I hope you get the two main points. And uh, because when it comes to prophecy, there are many things that fill in, the gaps get filled in over time. And so I'm not going to be one of these that stands up here acting like I've got all of every dot, jot, and tittle figured out of it. I, but at the same time, based on what the Bible says, I'm very, we, we have a very clear framework of what the Bible says is going to happen. There are some of those things that get filled in of who the specific players are and, and, and the things that happen to bring, these, uh, bring this about. But they're not going to succeed. And God is still the one in charge. He's put it in their hearts to fulfill His will. And we, as children of God, if you're saved, uh, how much more then should we be about filling, fulfilling His will? If He's getting the lost people, the Antichrist crowd, to fulfill His will... 
then we ought to be. It, it shouldn't take much then for us to be living according to the will of God with the right priorities, staying faithful to him.